Thank you, Soul Sanctuary. Absolutely marvellous. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Nico, for all the time you missed. Wonderful to have you with us. I'd now like to ask, as the team's been out of the way, I'd like to ask uh, Bishop Nicholas Hudson uh, from the Archdiocese of Westminster to come and introduce the evening very briefly. Bishop Nick. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome each and every one of you to Westminster Cathedral. Bathing our cathedral in red light this night unites us with countless other churches around the world, with all the churches which join with us in this global vigil, with the churches of northern Iraq, desecrated by Daesh, with the churches of Sudan, demolished by the government, with the churches of Egypt, bombed by terrorist groups. Standing in this place, I urge upon us four resolutions, four commitments. Never to take for granted the safety and security in which we practice our own beliefs, always remembering those who face harm or even death because of their faith. To take practical actions wherever we can, be it supporting the work of ACN and CSW, writing to prisoners of conscience, or simply raising awareness in our own parishes to speak out for our brothers and sisters in God who come from other religions and are suffering for their beliefs, from Iraq's Yazidis to Myanmar's Yoringa Muslims. Above all, to take up Pope Francis's call to offer prayers for those who are persecuted. Pray with him to God to hear the prayers of those who abide in God in dangerous times and in dark valleys and to draw them quickly to his side. I hope, in a word, that tonight's event will inform and inspire us together to play our part in the defence of faith and freedom for all. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Nick. And you referred already to some of the churches and buildings around the world lit up. We've been going around on this bus, which you'll see to the left today, round all sorts of places in London, people have been stopping and staring. We stopped in Trafalgar Square. St. Martin in the Field is going red tonight. All Souls Langham Place is going red. St. Marylebone going red. But around the country, in Scotland, cathedrals are going red. Birmingham, both the Anglican and Catholic cathedrals are going red. Town Hall Towers are going red. And in the Philippines today, all the basilicas and the cathedrals were lit red and we received a marvellous photograph from Manila Cathedral. Everyone dressed in red in the cathedral, and masses celebrated there. And we're delighted to be joined just not by only Christian Solidarity worldwide this year, in partnership with Aid and the Church in Need, but also by representatives of other faiths tonight, and especially the Ahmadiyya Muslims who are with us. We've also got representative of Muslim Aid. We've invited people from other religious communities to be with us. And what is tonight about? What is the purpose of this act today. It is to stand up for faith and freedom. Is it acceptable that someone should be denied work, housing, liberty, or even lose their life because of their religious belief? Yet this is happening in so much of the world. And we know from all the research done that 75 to 80 percent of that discrimination is sadly against Christians in so many parts of the world. But as Bishop Nick has said, here we also remember the Rohingya Muslims. The other day also Nigerian Muslims in northern Iraq, 50 were killed in a bombing in a mosque on Monday whilst at prayer. We think of the Jewish communities who've been suffering attacks in different parts of Europe. We think also of the Mandeans and the Yazidis, as well as the Christians on the Nineveh plain in Iraq. We are not alone here as we stand up for faith and freedom. We think of all those parts of the world where we are united in prayer and solidarity. Last night we were getting messages, not just from northern Iraq, where now, for the first time ever, as far as I know, a church is lit in red and a prayer vigil in Erbil and Kawa in Erbil, with our friend Archbishop Marshall Warder there at prayer with his community. But also, we're linked with communities elsewhere in the world. We're linked with the people who are supporting aid to the church in need, supporting CSW. We are linked with those whose, to whom 
religious liberty matters. I'd like to ask you tonight to take away from tonight the understanding of how important it is to believe, yes, but to have the right to express that belief. That is part of the UN Declaration of Human Rights that's so widely ignored. We are free to do that here, to stand up for faith and freedom, at the moment at least. We must take advantage of that and never let that freedom go. But let us ask and let us reflect on, in our own hearts on the words of Father Veracruz, which I quoted last year, about those who are suffering today. They are being tested in faith. We are being tested in love. I ask you tonight, to listen to some of the marvellous speeches you will hear. We are delighted to be able to have representatives from Parliament with us, to have representatives of different communities. Chip Shannon, who is the chairman of the all-party parliamentary group for religious freedom um, and the right to believe. Chip, we're delighted to have you with us. Perhaps you'd like to speak now before we show the bill. Thank you very much. Sirs, ladies and gentlemen, it's always a, a, a pleasure to come to any event when we recognise and recall those who have been persecuted across the world. So for me tonight is a special night. I want to say how grateful I am to the aid to the Church in Nate and the Christian Solidarity Worldwide for organising this very important event and inviting me to go along and say a few words. I want to thank the aid to the Church in Nate for, and also the uh, Christian Solidarity Worldwide for the, the opportunity to visit. Iraq as I did with them uh, and meet some of those who have been persecuted for their faith in Iraq uh, and, and who are today able to, to practice their religion and practice their belief uh, even though under pressure. Thank you for arranging for us to get all together here around the country so we can stand in solidarity with people the world over who are persecuted for their peacefully held beliefs. I was asked at my church, the Baptist Church in Newton Arms in Northern Ireland, and hope everyone can follow my accent because I'll try not to speak too fast, but I'm not sure if that's going to be possible. Um, but uh, it, it, they asked me, what, was I going to be here in, uh, for this event on, on Wednesday night? And I said, yes, I was, and here I am. And also, when you go by the House of Commons, you'll notice that the House of Commons in Parliament is covered in red tonight as well. It's been a privilege to work closely with both the Aid to the Church and Nate and Christian Solidarity Worldwide in my role as Chair of the United Kingdom All-Party Parliamentary Group on Freedom of Religion and Belief. And to put it into perspective, in the world, in this year, 2017, 100,000 people will die because of their Christian beliefs. 200 million will live, will be persecuted for their Christian beliefs. And 2 billion live in what is termed as a, a, as a, a, a endangered neighbourhood. So it gives you an idea of the, of the magnitude of what it means to be a Christian across the world. Of the, in the APPG All-Party Parliamentary Group, we are a group of some, some almost 100 cross-party parliamentarians for both the House of Lords and the House of Commons who work to promote the global realisation of Article 18 of the Declaration of Human Rights. The article guarantees that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. This right includes freedom to change one's religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest one's religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. So we stand tonight, all of us up here, down there, across the world, wherever these uh, gatherings are happening, for any persecutor for their faith or belief, be they of a Christian belief, be they of other belief, or be they of no belief. Because our Lord and Savior, we worship and serve, loves us all. Persecuted 
not just in rhetoric and talking about it as we perhaps did in the past, but taking it to reality. And we now have a commitment from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and from Diffin that in every embassy across the world, wherever there's, that there's an embassy and a British embassy, that the, the issue in, well, of priority of those who have been persecuted is central to what they do. So we've moved on, and we've moved on well, and you should be encouraged by that. Um, uh, to those who haven't got a copy or would wish to go online, I'll just say what the APPG's website is, www.appgfreedomofreligionorbelief.org. Uh, Through implementing recommendations of this report, this report here, we believe that governments, both our own here at Westminster, across the world can help improve the lives of millions of vulnerable people worldwide. We can be a voice for the voices, speak for those who have no one to speak for them. The right to freedom of religion or belief is a fundamental human right and is under threat around the world. It is vital that we come together on days like this to remember that the freedoms we sometimes take for granted in our own homes, in our own churches, in our own country are denied to so many. I hope and pray that through all our efforts here collectively and through events like these we can help to create a world in which all religion or belief groups are free to live and practice their beliefs in peace. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, very much. Welcome to speak to us now, Mervis, Mervyn Thomas. Mervyn is a good friend of ours, the founder and chief executive of Christian Solidarity Worldwide. Mervyn.
Omar Kurdistan. Even in Baghdad, the situation is not better. The militias are confiscating the home of the Christian. Sometimes they kidnap the Christian and demand large ransom to free them. This has forced the Christian to leave their homes and flee from this unlawful act. The Christians are finding it more and more difficult to find work and the Christian women are being forced to wear a hijab. The corrupt Iraqi government has not helped and does not care. They are sectarian Iraqi parliament are busy changing many of the modern laws and replacing them by Middle Ages laws that are being imposed upon the Christian as well. Furthermore, this is not held from the West apart from promises. Today, a lot of Christians are trapped in Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey while waiting to be resettled in safer countries as they do not feel they have any future in their homeland, where under the Iraqi control or the Kurdistan control. Therefore, I call upon the British government to provide real help and provide sanctuary to the persecuted Christians. Also, I call upon the United Nations to take better care of the Christians. The Middle East the Christians are losing hope and they are feeling that they are being neglected and even subjected to indirect persecution by the West. We are in desperate need to protect the Christians of the Middle East. I would like to ask you all to pray for our persecuted Christian people. A praying is our weapon to fight the enemy. Our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us to love, forgive, and pray even for enemies. He has also taught to pray consistently to, uh, to avoid being placed into temptation. A pray and a pray and a pray for me. Thank you.
is by the name of Martha and does not mention him. Matthew tells us that we must endure through our persecution and that the reward for our commitment will be salvation. You will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Christian martyr Shabal Svati is a shining example of a man written daily for his faith who endured and now wears the martyr's crown in heaven. Pakistan's only Christian federal minister who sacrificed his life to protect others. May God rest his soul. My father is now going to share some accounts of persecution in Pakistan. There are many accounts I could share. Three teenagers have been slain in the last three months. One by police officers, one by fellow colleagues in his school, and one found with his head sliced off in a, in a local park. But I'm going to start with the story of Asya Bibi, who has become the emblem of the Pakistani Christian campaign. This poor woman was a berry picker on a farm. On a particularly hot day, she felt parched. She went to a local well. She grabbed a cup there, she pumped some water into that cup, drank from it, felt that she could assist her Muslim co-workers, poured some more into, a, a, another, into the same cup and delivered it to them. It was thrown at her. Confused, she asked why. They berated her, they berated her family, they berated her faith, but they went to push too far. They then berated her Christ, her Lord, her Saviour, her God. She couldn't take this, so she responded. Not aggressively, she simply said the words, My Christ died for me, what did Muhammad do for you? For this simple utterance, this innocent question, she was, her men were called across. They put her into a room, she was gang raped. She woke up hours later, picked herself up, her clothes ripped to shreds, ran home. The next morning, a mob of over 5,000 were baying for her death, calling for her to be lynched. The three other Christian families in the neighborhood called the local police for her safe custody. A local imam then went to the police station said, this, this woman has committed a blasphemy. She must be sentenced for death. She's now been serving for seven years in prison. When they took her case to the High Court, hundreds of thousands of Muslims boycotted outside government buildings calling for her death. The High Court decided due to a technicality they could not free her. Nobody knows what that technicality is to, to, to date. A Supreme Court hearing that should have been held last October was stopped on the day of the on the day of the hearing because the, the Supreme Court judge realised he had a conflict of interest because he'd sat on an, another difficult case that had a close link to Asia Bibi. He resigned ten days later. No longer does he answer any questions about it. The second case, which, which will terrify you, it's a very harrowing account of a woman, a, a, of, of brick kiln workers, the slaves that my daughter spoke about. Shama and Shazad worked in a brick kiln. A whole day's work, 14 hours, three pounds, they would earn at the end of the day. Signed a thumbprint with a con uh, their patriarch, Shama, signed a, a contract with a thumbprint, too illiterate to write his own name. Whilst he was making bricks, the landlord asked for his home to be cleaned. The, the, the accountant of the landlord decided to rape Shama. She returned home, told her husband. What did he do? The offence was too great. He went to the master, called for his freedom. The master said, yes, you can go free, but first you must pay your fine. As soon as that contract had been signed, £50 became £5,000 debt. It was impossible for him to pay. Fearful that the fact that two of them would run away with their children, the whole family was locked in a room on a field. Whilst they were locked there, the accountant, trying to save his reputation, went to the local mosques and preached that a blasphemy had occurred and that Shama and Shazad had burnt shreds or uh, sections of the Quran. A, a, a mob of between 3,000 to 10,000, depending on which report you read, appeared at the, the building. They couldn't break down the walls, they climbed onto the roof. They ripped a hole through the roof, grabbed the ch one-year-old child from Shama's, ha Shama's hands, threw it to the floor. The child survived. 
I can't imagine the terror this couple fit, faced as they heard that mob outside their, uh, outside their building. The couple was stripped, beaten. Uh, the uh, Shama was gang raped in front of her husband. The wrists were tied with rope. Uh, the rope extended and was attached to a tractor. They were, they were uh, dragged across rough terrain. But they survived. We know this because their seven, six year old child at the time noticed that they were twitching as they were burned in the fires of the kiln, as all those Muslims watched. Their children are safe now. BBCA and various other charities are supporting the three of them through various means. I'm calling for prayer for something very simple. We're asking for a fair of Pakistan. It's a very simple prayer to make. We're asking for removal of the offensive text in the national curriculum of Pakistan that demonizes, caricatures, and even goes as far as labeling Christians as spies, spies for the West. We're also calling people to pray for removal of the draconian blasphemy law of Pakistan that is being used as a tool for discrimination and persecution. Thank you very much.
there. So Bishop Angelos, we're absolutely <laughs> delighted uh, from now to the Diocese of London, the UK Coptic Orthodox Church, to hear from you with a testimony and a call for prayer and action. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Neville and Mervyn. Uh, and thank you to all of you for being here on this special day. When we look around and we're mesmerized by the buildings, the epitome of modernity, the epitome of Christian life and witness in the midst of it, our history just down the road, and the hustle and bustle of life here in Britain, we consider that we are here in the heart of London, in the heart of the United Kingdom, and some of us would like to think the heart of the world. Yet in the midst of all of this, it is unfathomable to think that there are still hundreds of years, potentially, who suffer for their faith until today. As Christians, of course, we focus on the black of our and sisters.
Thank you for those truly inspiring words and that call to both prayer and action. <laughs> Talking of prayer now, I'd like to ask representatives of different denominations to come and lead us in prayer for a few minutes here this evening. Thank you. Let's pray. We pray for all displaced Christians who have been forced from their homes. May the Holy Spirit comfort them and give them the gifts of faith, hope and perseverance. We especially pray for the displaced communities of Abil and elsewhere in Kurdish, northern Iraq and ask for your protection of thousands returning to the Nineveh plains. May your peace descend on all those who have lost their homes, livelihoods and way of life. May our own hearts be moved to offer material aid as we continue to intercede for them as they seek to return to their homelands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our Lord, you are the Prince of Peace and offer true and lasting peace to all peoples. We ask that the power of forgiveness and reconciliation may fall on families, communities and countries where there is suspicion, fear and hostility. Change the hearts of those who think violence is the answer and protect the world from discrimination, terrorism and war. May we all work to build just, unified and tolerant communities where the peace of Christ can overcome all division. Lord, in your mercy. for your blessing on the work of Christian solidarity worldwide and aid to the church in need. Give your strength to all who stand up for faith and freedom and help us to build your kingdom as we defend the right to freedom of religion. Guide those who work in dangerous areas and bless our benefactors who enable us to work and comfort our brothers and sisters in need. As the body of Christ, may all Christians be visible witness to God's love and the power of the gospel. We also pray for those who persecute and offer into your hands all who oppose us, as you commanded us to. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. should come to you to find rest. We pray that you will carry those who have lost loved ones, all who have been unfairly imprisoned, tortured, denied jobs or education, or suffered punishment for their faith. We remember all people of faith and ask for freedom of conscience for every person as made in your image. Bless Christians as well as those of other world faiths and none who hold beliefs
pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on religious communities. Sisters, clergy, youth leaders, ministers, lay leaders, teachers, and all who try to live authentic lives of faith. Give your people joy, faith, and hope, as we remember that whatever we do for the least of our brothers and sisters is for you. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you. 